So what are you guys looking at now? Solar cars? Whoa, those go fast, don't they? Oh, one is uh, the, the Blues Brothers police cars. The other one's the DeLorean. From Back to the Future. So you're setting up a big tsunami hit, huh? Yeah. Okay. Let's see what happens. Oh, look at the big tsunami wave. Hitting, 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 and pow! That knocked everything out. Okay, this is a medium wave. Well, that still hit pretty good.
We are going to the Old Ben Coal Mining Company where we will be going on the coal mine exhibit and the coal mine train. Um, hi guys, my name is Caitlin. Welcome to the coal mining exhibit. Today we're going to be talking about what life was like for coal miners over the past 100 years. We're going to start off by seeing some old equipment and we'll also be talking about how it's developed and changed over time. I have more guide today as we're going down into the coal mine. Now, I think we're ready to get started, so you can get your hard hats on, get your steel-toed boots on, and we're going to be time traveling down to 1920. So we're going to start by going into this elevator, which is called a man cage, and that's going to take us down into our remote lights. So for just one moment, I'd like to turn the lights down so you can see how dark it would have been for those coal miners to commute to work. Wow. That's wow. dark. Yeah. I can see nothing. They would have to ride in darkness for anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour to get to work each day. And they'd be holding onto these chains above head because there weren't any walls to lean against. Everybody was also responsible for buying and bringing their own tools to work each day. So you had to be careful not to drop one off the side. One I should mention, there used to be 40 people in here at one time. So it was a super crowded ride. Wow. We're now going to go around the corner here. You might if I step out as well so I can lead you guys. Well, welcome to our coal seam layer rotary dump, which is going to tip the cart backwards and it dumps the coal back onto a scale. That's how they would weigh the coal. And they had to weigh it so they knew how much to pay the workers. They didn't earn an hourly wage. They were paid according to how much of the coal they returned to the company. Um, now, do I have any guesses on how much money you might earn for a cart full of coal, about 2,000 pounds of coal? Well, 10 cents is probably the closest. They would earn between 11 and 17 cents. They also got to make up the form of payment. People didn't get paid in cash. They got paid in coupons. This stuff is called script. If anybody now, we are going to next cut up this staircase, and we're going to see some safety equipment from the 1920s. I can lead you guys up. On the way, we're back out of the mine to go get some medical attention. So safety is very important to the coal miners, and preventing danger is really important. What I got here is a safety lamp. These were used to detect the presence of methane gas down in the coal mine. The way it works is it's got this mesh screen here that allows air to flow into the lantern and methane will respond to flame. So they were looking for this, this flame to change color. If it changed color, that would be their sign that they needed to begin evacuating the coal mine. Now this mesh screen is really important because it also is going to prevent that fire from escaping, from leaping and catching fire to the flammable gas in the air around the coal miners, the flammable coal wall, Clothes covered in coal dust are also flammable. There's a lot of things that can catch fire in coal mines. But on my lantern, I've actually got a little bit of damage on that mesh screen. I've been knocked over or hit with a pickaxe. So I'd like to show you guys what happens when a damaged methane methane gas. We're going to do a little science experiment here. For the best view of our experiment, you folks will probably want to find a spot where you can see the glass on the front of this box. But I just ask you to keep your toes outside of this yellow shape on the floor here. I'm going to start off by protecting my eyes. I put on some safety goggles. Always a good idea when you're where, when you're doing a science experiment. Contain this lantern here. Lock it up. And I'm going to dim the light so you guys can see the color change in our lantern really well. All right, let's start to pump in that methane gas, and when you see the color change, say, whoa! No. Whoa! Oh, yeah. Do you guys see what color it turned? Blue. Blue, absolutely. If this was working correctly, we'd see a very tall blue flame rise up inside of the lantern. But today, it blew up. Oh, no. <laughs> Now, luckily, we're not using this type of lantern any longer. In the 1950s, this little guy was invented. This is our pocket methanometer. Still allows airflow through the backside, but now you see a digital readout tells you how much methane is in the air around you. And when the alarm goes off on this one, it will not explode. There's a hammer on the inside that starts to bang around. And you might hear it, you're definitely gonna feel a lot of vibration. 
as your signals leave the mine. There's also a methanometer on all mining equipment, so you are never without this important safety device. I'd like you guys to take a little bit of a guess. This train ride is pretty fun. It's short, but it, we're going to start off by going through a tunnel. So you can expect it to get a little bit darker, a little bit louder, and we'll also be seeing some coal miners hard at work. Is it back here? These train cars were first pulled by horses down here. <laughs> Got pretty dark. Stop, we're gonna see a machine. 
machine that we still use today. It's called a long wall. On the way, we're passing through a cave hallway. You can spot some fossils on the ceiling as we walk through here. Coal machine, these were created in the 1960s, and this is the start of automated coal mining. So most people working in this industry today no longer need to come down into the coal mine. Although it's a really interesting and unique place to be, not a lot of people get to come 600 feet below the Earth's surface, um, it's pretty dangerous. So if we can minimize the number of people who are coming down here in the first place, we can keep everybody a lot safer. So people who work in this industry on the surface will be making a plan for where to mine in the future. Uh, and they can control this machine from the surface. This moving wheel, that's called a shearer. It's actually going to be running straight into a block of coal. So if you imagine, like, I'm a block of coal, and those orange teeth are going to be tearing into the coal. Coal's pretty easy to break, but we're reinforcing those orange teeth with a hard material. Also, some water that's misting behind that wheel, that's going to decrease the amount of dust picked up, and it's also going to reduce the risk of a fire starting. Coal mine fires are incredibly Well, thank you for the tour. Oh, thank you. Now oh, we're at the U-505 submarine. Look at how big this sucker is. Wow. Look at that torpedo coming out of the chute. How 
how massive is that? Well, here they are trying to save the submarine. What a good crew. Our tour guide is Chris. This German submarine from World War II. This is an actual German submarine. Uh, this boat served in the German Navy from 1941 to 1944 by the United States Navy and its Hunter Killer Task Group 2243. That group was led by Captain Dan Gallery, who happened to be a native of Chicago, which is why we have this U boat in our collection today. Officers' quarters. This is where the lowest-ranking officers would have slept. They got a privacy screen. Take a look in the forward torpedo room. That's where the enlisted sailors slept. They slept with the torpedoes. All of these crew members would have practiced something called hot bunking. 30, 59 crew members shared 35 bunks. At the end of a shift, a sailor would get into a hot, sweaty, smelly, lice-infested bunk. Um, there would be a lot of downtime on these cruises. They might go days or weeks without seeing supply ships. So they would play cards, roll dice, or listen to this French dance hall music. This music was illegal in mainland Germany at the time, but because this boat was based in France and they were away at sea, they could bend, get by with many a few rules. It was not, however, a pleasure cruise. If they spotted a supply ship, they would notify the Oh, some nice, uh, some nice bunks over here. Oh, radio room. 
Oh, do you have anybody else from this? Yeah. Okay, coming on, crew. Okay. Um, the uh, now what we talked about previously was uh, might have been a typical engagement for the U505. Now we're going to talk about a very atypical day, the day this boat was captured, June 4th, 1944. Uh, up in the control tower, conning tower outside, one of the sailors on duty spotted in the distance the five destroyers and uh, aircraft carrier of Hunter Killer Task Group 22.3. They notified Captain Longa, who sounded the emergency crash dive signal. Immediately, anybody not on duty ran to the front of the boat with a dog pile to try to weigh the nose of the boat down as quickly as possible. A successful crash dive could be completed in 37 seconds. Now it's going to go from very noisy to very quiet in a matter of seconds. And that's because this boat is switching over from diesel power to battery electric power. This is a hybrid vehicle, much like our hybrid automobiles today. Now, you might notice some whispering going on. Sound was very important because sound travels very well underwater. Even someone speaking at my volume could give away the location of the U-505. So whispering was the order of the day. That pinging sound you hear, that's not coming from this boat. That's coming from one of the ships of Hunter Killer Task Group 22.3 up at the surface. That is their active sonar, a form of echolocation, trying to locate this German submarine. <laughs> so the, sh <coughs> the ships are sending that sound. Yes, the ships are sending that sound down. And the louder in time, the closer in time those pings, the louder those pings became, the closer that the crew members of the U-505 knew they were to be discovered by the U.S. Navy. There would have been some very tense moments for the crew members of this boat. What would concern them is if they heard the sound of splashes up at the surface. Splashes at the surface uh, would indicate what you're thinking of, sir, that one of the ships, or one or more of the ships up at the surface had launched depth charges. A depth charge is an explosive device that sinks to a certain level and explodes. They do not need to be uh, a direct hit to be effective, simply in the neighborhood. Let's listen in. Oh, there you hear it. Splash number one, splash number two. Now all a sailor could do was break. <laughs> They were not direct charges, but they were direct hits. They were effective. They jammed the rubber of the U-505 to the right and took out its electricity, causing it to head in a death spiral toward the bottom of the ocean. Captain Wanda had a choice. He could condemn himself and his crew to certain death, or he could attempt to surface this boat and sink it intentionally. Captain Longa chose a second option. They filled the ballast tanks with air, causing it to come shooting up to the surface. There, Captain Longa and some of his crew members scrambled up this ladder to the conning tower outside. They discovered they were surrounded by the five destroyers and aircraft carrier of Hunter Killer Task Group 22.3. And, and, they were, and aircraft were coming over, delivering six minutes of uninterrupted gunfire. Captain Longo was hit in the hip, one of his sailors was killed. At that point, Captain Longo gave the abandoned boat command. The remaining crew members scrambled up this ladder and into life rafts and into the ocean. Uh, but not before one of them had opened up a sea stringer valve, a pipe leading right into the ocean, in an, in an attempt to sink this very boat. Um, now, uh, in the meantime, eight U.S. sailors, seven of whom had never been on a submarine before, arrived in a whale boat. They scrambled down this ladder, gathered as much intelligence as quickly as possible. Charts, code books, documents, the Enigma machines, up this ladder and into the whale boat. They didn't know how much time they had before this boat sank. Um, one quick-thinking sailor, Zen and Dean Lucosius, spotted the open sea strainer valve. Luckily for him, the cap was right next to the valve. He lifted up the cap, closed the pitch valve, keeping the boat from sinking further. We're going to see that very uh, valve and cap as we exit this room. Please go to the right of this pillar and follow me out the room. Famous veil that let the water in. We 
got the diesel engines going here. Oh, the diesel. It's diesel engine. It smells a lot like crams to me, uh, but that is diesel fuel. These engines last ran in 1980, uh, the 1980s, when the museum hired railroad engineers from one of the local railroads to come and get the diesel engines running again. This boat was located outside at the time. Well, welcome to the electric motor room. Uh, the uh, boat is now under the control of the U.S. Navy. Uh, but there was a problem. They kept trying to tow it in a straight line, but the U-505, remember that jammed rudder, kept wanting to go to the right. It's really hard to tow a boat that wants in a straight line that keep, wants to keep moving to the right. So they needed to get to the manual rudder control behind this closed hatch. Now a closed hatch on a stricken submarine can mean one or both of two bad things. Number one, it could be booby-trapped with an explosive device intended to go off when the hatch is open. Opening the hatch could sink the boat. Number two, it could be flooded behind this hatch. Opening the hatch could sink the boat. So Captain Dan Gallery came down himself. Uh, do we head that to it, sir? Let me go around. Sir? Ah. Somebody, is that someone from our team? Yep. Please come back. Thank you so much. Um, so Captain Dan Gallery, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, Captain Dan Gallery came down, felt around the hatch for any uh, liars that might indicate an explosive device. Uh, finding none, he had his men brace themselves against the hatch in hopes of being able to close the hatch if they found it flooded. Good luck for that. Yes, exactly. And they opened the hatch. Now luckily for them, there was only minor flooding at the floorboard level. And in the distance, you might see that uh, round st steering wheel-like device. It looks like a steering wheel. That is the manual rudder control. They're able to straighten out the rudder, allowing the, the, the boat to be towed in a straight line. Right. We're, going to, uh, we're going to head out of the boat at this point. Um, when we walk by the, this little stairwell, be sure to look to your left You'll see the checkerboard floorboard. That's one of the two bathrooms on board this boat. It is slightly larger than a lavatory on a jet airplane. And then we're gonna meet outside at the bottom of the stairs outside. Um, uh, please be sure to keep our masks on after we exit the boat, as long as we are together. I'm gonna to get something here. Well, what a nice tour of that submarine. So guys, what did you think of the tour so far? Awesome. They gave you a lot of value of that intelligence that was just captured. So instead, they towed this boat over 2,500 nautical miles to Bermuda, the closest friendly port. There, the boat was repainted and renamed the USS Nemo. That's Latin for nobody. Nothing to see here. It's not a German boat. Look the other way. Uh, the boat remained there in Bermuda for the duration of conflicts in Europe. After or the 58 surviving crew members were taken to a prisoner of war camp in Ruston, Louisiana, where they were the only prisoners. Nobody else was there. <laughs> Uh, they didn't want word getting back to Germany that they'd seen the U-boat crew there. And so, uh, in violation of the Geneva Convention, Admiral King of the U.S. Navy did not notify the, the International Red Cross of their capture. Technically, this was a war crimes violation. Uh, in late July 1945, 44, sorry, late July, the German Navy uh, not having heard from the U from the U-505 since early June, could only conclude that this boat had either been captured or lost at sea, notified the family members of the crew that their loved ones were missing in action. 
after the victory in Europe, this boat, uh, eight days after victory in Europe, must have come as bittersweet news uh, that those crew members, uh, actually 58 of them, had survived and were in the prisoner of war camp. Uh, U.S. Navy issued a press release. Um, after, they would eventually get repatriated to Germany in 1947. After the VE Day. This boat was taken to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to the naval base there where it was used for as a training vessel. Um, in 1953, Captain, now Admiral Gallery, heard that it was going to be used for target practice. He wanted to make a war memorial out of it, and so he notified, he asked the Navy how much would it cost to for this boat. They said it's free. You just have to pay for transportation. So Dan Gallery found some civic-minded Chicagoans willing to put up the quarter of a million dollars to pay for the tra tra towing of this boat through the St. Lawrence River, into the Great Lakes, into Lake Michigan, to our shoreline, not 300 yards from where we're standing right now. One night, in September 1954, uh, DuSable Lakeshore Drive was shut down a temporary railroad laid across the drive, the U-boat pulled across the drive, the railroad picked up in time for the morning commute. The boat came to rest outside our museum, where it endured 50 cold Chicago winters, rusting away, exposed to the elements. In 2004, we built this new home for it, designed to resemble a German U-boat pen, lowered it in, covered it over, restored it to the condition we find it in today. This boat remains here as a war memorial to the over 55,000 American men and women who gave their lives in the battles for the Atlantic in both World Wars I and II. Our mission here at MSI is to inspire the inventive genius in everyone. Uh, our vision is to inspire and motivate our children to achieve their full potential in the fields of science, technology, medicine, and engineering. We have a, a medical corpsman here today from the U.S. Navy, who's based in Great Lakes right now. And uh, so we, we always are looking to inspire our kids to follow those fields of medicine and engineering, science and technology. Um, my name is Chris. I will stick around if you have any questions. Have a wonderful rest of your day here at MSI. Why this is a mirror maze, you don't know where you're coming or going. Wait, if they don't see a flashing skull, but if you can't do a clue. Where? Oh, here? Here's a mirror. Look at that. Mirrors. Huh. How does everybody know where they're going? I don't know. Good thing we're following people. <laughs> you gotta touch to see if there's a mirror or if we're blocked out.
Oh yeah. <laughs> this is kind of cool. How do you how do you get out? No, how do you get out? <coughs> you think this is a spot, but no. <laughs> I think we're stuck. We reached a dead end. The, this is open, but then a dead end. <laughs> it, it is <coughs> a maze. Is there an exit or just an entrance? <laughs> oh, wow. Some, somehow we got into the same place we went out. <laughs>